Welcome to this session on capture, capture limitations of a laptop. Uh, it was interesting the last couple years of coming here to SharkFest. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, capture samples, a capture interpretation, looking through traces, applying filters, showing how to do that. But we didn't see a lot on just how to get the packets in the first place. So that's where this session was hatched. So just talking about how we know at what point we need to start investing in some of the big bad uh, hardware-based capture tools, uh, since most of us are probably using it on a laptop, at least mobily. So uh, let's talk about that. But just before getting into that, just want to introduce myself. My name's Chris Greer, work for a company called Packet Pioneer, mostly doing network analysis and training, um, all that. So if you're uh, interested more in what we do, you can come up afterward and we can talk about it. So agenda, basically we're gonna be talking about why do I care? Why do I care when a packet starts to drop packets? Why is this something that I should even be concerned with? Also, answering that question, we're going to be having some fun with a, a packet analyzer and also a traffic generator, firing packets at a laptop and seeing at what point it starts to tip over. Um, also at the end of the session, if you have Wireshark on your machine, if you have something that you'd like to shoot out, Go ahead and bring it up and then we can plug it into my analyzer and we can, we can see at what point your box starts to drop. In the last session we had quite a few people come up and do it and it was interesting to say the least to see the results of the different styles and flavors of Wireshark, hardware platforms, drivers and so on. So um, a lot of variation in uh, the results that we got. Also how can I tell in a trace file if I'm just looking at a packet trace What's, what uh, symptoms or signatures should I be looking for that should start to make me think about a possible packet loss, like genuine um, packet loss in terms of my analyzer was not able to keep up with the, the packet stream. And then a little bit on how to uh, optimize Wireshark. And then uh, if we do decide that we need to go to a hardware device, what are some options for us? And then like I said at the end, a laptop shootout. I have a couple labs. I'm just going to um, flip in and out of PowerPoint here, going back to Wireshark. And we're going to take a look at, uh, first of all, just the default settings of Wireshark. Uh, what happens when I, I slam a gig of traffic at it? Next, also a command line, dump cap. So does that make any difference? Do I buy any bandwidth, so to speak? Or can I go on higher utilization if I use a, a command line based capture? And then also optimize Wireshark capture. So. Let's go ahead and get into that first question. So why should I care about this in the first place? Well, maybe you've, uh, back, in, back when you were putting puzzles together as a kid, you work hard, you put together this whole puzzle, get all the edges done, you start filling in all the pieces, and then you come to find out that that one piece that you need wasn't in the box. And that's the one that matters, right? That's the one that, uh, it's the eyesore. If you take the jigsaw puzzle glue and put it up on the wall, that's the one that you, you notice is missing. Well, in, in a capture situation, if we have packet loss, maybe you guys were in, uh, had the opportunity to see Jasper's uh, session this morning. Uh, he had an example of an analyzer that wasn't able to keep up with some of the traffic. And Wireshark flagged that for him. Now, that was in his session because a lot of people get hung up on that. The analyzer says previous packet can't be displayed or assume packet loss. A lot of people stop there and then they think, great, my network's dropping packets, let's go find out where. And we can spend a lot of time troubleshooting the wrong thing, simply because our analyzer could not see accurate traffic that was going on, that led us down the wrong uh, pathway to troubleshoot uh, and resolve a problem that really wasn't even there. So what our goal is, as analysts, we're only as good as the packets that are in front of us, right? If we can't see them all, we can't use them to effectively troubleshoot the problem. Worst case, the one packet that we really need is one of the ones that's missing, right? Then our whole analysis uh, session could be thrown out the window and we have to go back and recapture. So why do I care? Because we wanna make sure that we're accurately seeing every single packet as represented as closely as possible on the wire to make sure we don't have anything missing and also that timers aren't, aren't affected. Also today, another reason why this is becoming an, an something we should be increasingly concerned about is because this day and age, if we're doing capture in, in a data center environment, 10 and further gig length, 
uh, in a data center with more and more traffic, voice, video, uh, going across these links, we're, we're starting to fire hose traffic at these poor machines that are trying to keep up with the traffic rate, right? So more and more data anymore, uh, and really that's what this whole session's about. At what point should we start to be concerned and really get into uh, hardware-based capture solutions? So um, if we were in Gerald's session a couple days ago, he mentioned that there's a, about half a million downloads of Wireshark every single month. And in fact, at the end of that, he noted uh, that's just in some instances. In some cases, it's even higher. Some months are even higher than that. If we think about that number, that's a tremendous amount of people that are going and downloading Wireshark, right? Now, think to yourself, of that number of downloads, how many do you think are to laptops or to a device they can walk around with? I'm, I don't have the statistics on that, and uh, I wasn't able to get them. But we can imagine that that's a pretty good number of people that are downloading them, placing them on a laptop, and just hitting capture. Um, I, I reckon to say it's somewhere in the 90 percentile. Perhaps some people are, are downloading to servers, but really, as we'll go on to see, we could have the same problem there. So they download. They probably downloaded, at least initially, to a laptop. How many of these users leave the optimization settings in Wireshark at the default rate? Meaning, they install, they open, they hit capture without going into some of the preferences that we're going to talk about to adjust it and possibly squeeze a few more uh, megs out of their capture potential. Again, likely most, right? So uh, we could venture to say most people, they are, are going to be affected by uh, this scenario we're going to be talking about, and, and maybe us ourselves. And the reason is because laptops, they have a purpose, don't they? And fundamentally, that is to provide the users, you and I, with email, with uh, application platforms to be able to do our jobs, web, uh, iTunes, and so on. They're not built to be network analysis tools. So Dell, Apple, whoever it may be, they didn't get with the NIC card manufacturer and uh, customize a protocol driver inside there that will absolutely keep up with a high rate of traffic, right? It's just not their purpose. And that could be a good thing, right? It keeps laptops cheap. It's part of the reason why some of the hardware-based stuff is so expensive, because they did go to that level and custom-build hardware, uh, custom-build those drivers. So network analysis is not the purpose of most laptops, right? So. They're des designed basically like it, our little picture here on the bottom, just to keep people happy, to keep us uh, doing our work and, and, and keeping things going. So laptops are most network interface cards. It's pretty easy to see 1,000 gig on them, maybe 10 gig in some cases if we're using a fiber-based card. So is it really capturing at one gig? Well, uh, does that mean if I have a one gig capture card, I take a cable, plug it in, and I have a whatever level of utilization on my port coming at me, what percentage of that traffic will I capture? Can I really keep up with one gig of data? Well, most of us likely agree that no, it's probably not possible for a laptop to keep up with that level of data. But it's interesting to see in the last session, we went ahead and um, had a few guesses thrown around it. Uh, what percentage of traffic did they think that their NIC could keep up with? And we heard anything from 5% all the way up to 99%. I just, you know, if I pound a gig of traffic at your NIC, how much will it keep up with? But I think the consensus was no one thought that every NIC, every NIC will keep up with everything, right? It does have a capture limitation. So the question is, when is that? At what utilization point do we need to start to be concerned and consider a hardware-based capture? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to flip out a PowerPoint. And um, the setup that I have up here, I have a hardware-based traffic generator. That's a, a Fluke Network's OptiView. And what I have, its purpose here is to be our traffic generation. And it can hammer traffic out at one gig. And it keeps, what I like about what it does, is it keeps the deltas exactly the same between all those packets. I mean, it's it's perfect stream of, of traffic. I've captured with it, and I've also uh, transmitted with it end-to-end, um, -end, so we can trust it. 
for the same reason that we question our capture potential is the reason why I'm not up here with a software packet generator, right? I'm going to have the same question. If I, if I even put on a high-powered server, a software traffic generator, then how do I know if that generator can go up to the threshold that I hope it can, right? So for benchmarking, I, I want to use this tool. Uh, unfortunately for this session, I was trying to uh, get in touch with a certain vendor that has, um, uh, they actually do traffic simulation, all different type of packet sizes and different types of protocols, and you can ramp it up, and uh, you can uh, do lots of cool things with uh, the, the traffic itself to more closely simulate real traffic. Um, there were promises made. They said they'd get me a box, but unfortunately that wasn't possible for this session. So um, the traffic that I'm going to be generating it's not emulated traffic. It's not, uh, it doesn't necessarily represent what we're really going to see on the network. But for benchmarking purposes, I'm okay with that. I mean, I'm going to take that into consideration as, as we go forward with this different testing. But what we can do with the OptiView is we can do broadcast traffic, multicast, or unicast to a single station, and it's really easy to adjust the different traffic levels. So that's why we're going to use it here. As far as the aggregation switch, I have it back here. I think I'm just going to pop it up here at the end of the session if you guys want to come up and shoot yours out. But for now, I went ahead and bypassed it. Right now, I'm going from traffic generator straight into my NIC, so I don't have any hardware in the middle at all. So it's just going straight into my network interface card there. So let's go ahead and, and see what we can do. And every time I do this, I get a different result, right? My machine's busy doing the other things. Things I might not even be aware of. So if I go, um, this is just the OptiView browser right now, so you know how I have this set up. I'm actually controlling it through my wireless card, so I'm keeping my management traffic out of band. So I'm just going to control it and, and use it that way and fire packets directly out this other NIC here, or this other interface, and it's uh, connected into my network interface card. So here's the OptiView front page. If I come over here to generate, so down here at the bottom, I'm plugged in directly to my laptop. It's at a gig. It's at full duplex, so the, the highest potential of my network interface card. And what I have here is I'm, I'm able to send out what Fluke calls background traffic. And what they mean by this is that basically they're, they're emulating traffic, you could say, that everything else in the network should ignore. So the first, uh, if we look at the first byte of a multicast MAC address, it's basically one zero. So as soon as I see that first bit one and the second bit zero, I know, my NIC knows, this isn't for me, it's not a broadcast, that's not my address, I can ignore this. But the Wireshark driver, of course, is going to capture it. And we're gonna see that there's an interesting difference between the background traffic, and all devices broadcast. So I'm just going to select, just to start out, background traffic. And then I come over here to the type of traffic. I'm just going to do a benign IP, so um, IP packet with just stuff in it. Come down to the number of frames. This is my important number. I'm just going to transmit 100,000 frames. My question is, how many do I actually capture? If I come over here to the configuration settings, Frame size, we can adjust this. Unfortunately, I'm not able to randomize it with this analyzer, but we'll still get a, a good idea. Um, I'm going to start at 512. We can also adjust that if we choose to. And come over here to utilization, and I'm going to go ahead and pop that all the way up to 100%. So right now, the way that I'm set up, I'm going to slam out 100,000 packets, uh, 512 bytes, 100% utilization, now, the math on this, this is going to only take me 432 milliseconds to send out. It's going to pop it out really quickly. And what's interesting, so this is half a second, right? In a real environment, if I'm transmitting for 100% of half a second, and then that spike goes away, in a lot of interfaces, they might average that out, right? That's something I want to keep in mind as well. When we have traffic bursts, sometimes they can go really quickly for a portion of a second, not necessarily taking up that entire second, but if I look at a utilization measurement on an interface, maybe that interface only says, well, there's only 400 
um, 400 megabits per second on that interface. When really, I could have had a, a, a burst of genuine gig, right? So I'm going to bring up Wireshark. And I'm just going to select my local area connection, hit start. And I got some uh, just chatter data going in the background, a few broadcasts. If I come back to the OptiView, I come down, I hit start. It's going to burst this traffic out quickly. I'm going to uncheck this, go to proceed. Boom, there was my 100,000 packets. Now in the background, Wireshark's going to try to keep up with that. But if I stop, so for my first test here, other than my background traffic, I can come up here and set a filter if I choose to, but this is just a, a general number. So 60,000 packets. That's what I was able to capture with Wireshark. Default settings. I didn't do any adjustment or anything, but 60% of a gig. That's not too good, is it? If I see a burst of a, a gig of traffic. I don't know, in, in my last class, that was a surprise to a lot of people. They, they thought it would be a little bit more than that. So, um, and that's with the multicast traffic. Let's go ahead and try it with uh, another setting here. If I come back to the OptiView, um, let's do, uh, let's see if this changes it at all. Let's just throw broadcast out there. Now, of course, it's unlikely that we're gonna have this huge burst of, of uh, broadcast that we wanna capture, but let's just say it did happen. The question is, if there's a packet on the wire, am I able to capture it? That's what I'm interested in seeing. So I'm going to go back to Wireshark. I'm going to go up to the capture button. Start a new capture. Got a little bit of background chatter going there. Go back to my OptiView. And let's see if this changes. OK. So the multicast traffic, I caught 60,000 packets with broadcast traffic. So I just shot out at a gig, 100,000 packets, and my machine was only able to capture 6,000 of them, right? So very small percentage, 6% of the traffic. So if, if, if this was a real scenario here, very, very low capability, right, that I'm able to keep up with. Um, how about the last setting? Let's just say it's unicast traffic. I can set it a couple different ways, but I'm going to see if this makes any difference. If I come down to single destination, uh, with the OptiView, it's able to uh, transmit traffic to any station that it's seen. Uh, I'm just going to select my machine. And we'll try to remember that number there. So I had 60,000 more or less with the multicast, the chatter. I had 6,000 with broadcast. So let's see if this makes any difference. I'm going to go to capture. All right, let's see what happens with, with unicast traffic. OK. Now, since this was to me, it was, my machine was still processing it, right? That's why with both broadcast and unicast, not only am I trying to keep up with a high rate of traffic, but my NIC is also, or my, my protocol stack is also trying to process this traffic as well. So it's trying to say, hey, is this for me? Do I need to take action on it? This is a broadcast. This is an ARP I gotta respond to. What's the, it's busy doing all of, uh, all, all of that logic, right? So it's understandable it's gonna be less, but uh, the dramatic difference here, uh, usually when, when people see this, it's pretty eye-opening as far as just how, uh, how limited uh, a NIC can be, even though it's got gig stamped on it. So the next question is, do I see the same performance if I use, maybe, if we, maybe we forget the uh, GUI-driven Wireshark, what if we went out to the command line? How about uh, T-Shark, DumpCap, all those? So um, you know what, before I go to the... Uh, before I go to the uh, command line based capture, I'm going to go ahead and see at what point or at what percentage do I start to drop traffic with my, um, with my NIC. So I'm, I'm plugged back in here. So I'm going to come in and I'm going to change this to, let's just put it at 25% uh, of a gig. 
So this is 250, let's say 25%. Let's go ahead and just leave it on multicast or background traffic. And I'm going to come into Wireshark, go ahead and hit start. Come out to the OptiView. And this is, uh, you see this traffic in the background. This is the, uh, the OptiView trying to figure out what my NIC is. <laughs> it's the discovery uh, part of the OptiView. And that's, that'll actually stop in just a few seconds. Just to wash that out, make it fair. OK. Or I can filter it out later. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and generate my traffic. So this is 100,000 packets at about 250 megs per second. Going to start. And in the background, OK, stop. So here I see a, a, a number that I'm happier with, right? I like that a little better, 100,000. The rest of this, you know, if I, if I want to um, do exact benchmarking, which I don't have time to do in this session, but I'm a lot happier with that number, right? So 250 megs, if I, if I bump that up, I found with multicast I can get around 500 megs per second. Now the reality is, is that's, that's not going to be the type of traffic that we're actually generating, is it? So 100 megabits per second, I'm still not able to capture everything, right? And the other thing that's a little unsettling here is if we look at the delta time, I don't know if you're able to, to see that. Let me zoom in here. If we look at the packet delta, now the OptiView is sending out this traffic exactly in, in a, in with no jitter, right? With, with uh, no variation between the packets. I can only say that because I've caught what the OptiView sends. And there's always a perfectly consistent uh, uh, delta between the two. But even when it's trying to capture everything, my, my NIC is still involved here, right? The, the, the stack is trying to process and capture simultaneously. In fact, uh, I didn't show you this earlier, but um, with the larger data rates, a lot of times what you'll see is this huge number here. One of the deltas will just be huge, and then it'll have just a, a bunch of quick packets, and a, then a big delta, a bunch of quick packets, big. So you can see it's trying to swallow, it's trying to gulp capture more, gulp, capture more. So um, not only here are we um, concerned about the number of packets that we're seeing, but also the timers that are affected uh, by the NIC not being able to keep up. So that's another number or point of concern that we should have when we're capturing in high data rates. Is our hardware able to fully process not only the number of packets, but also do them with exactly the same timers that uh, represents reality on the wire. That's another reason why we may choose a, a hardware capture solution. All right, so we can see it's pretty bad with, uh, with broadcast, right, within the actual Wireshark user interface. There's a few things we can do here. Let's, let's first, let's go out to the command line. If I quit this, and let's just take a look at Dumpcat. Let's see if uh, we get any better of a result by, by capturing these with dump cap. So I'm going to go ahead and start my dump cap. So come out here. You can see this on the bottom. So this, I'm just going to say dump cap, I interface. I'm not really interested in a, a saving it out to a file or doing any, any of the other switches with it. I just want to see what number does it capture. So sorry that my, my, my packet's scrolling by. So this is, let's go ahead and go back up to 100, see if it was any better. If I go to start, there's my 100,000 again. So dump cap, that, that was just about a similar, it was a pretty close to what we saw within Wireshark, right? Um, if I come out to the OptiView, and let's go ahead and change back to multicast and restart our dump cap. If I come out to multicast, Hit start again. There we go. There's our 60-ish. In fact, it's even worse, 56,000. What does this look like? So how do I know if my machine is starting to do this? Or what, what should I see in the packet trace that is a symptom of this behavior, that it's not able to keep up with the packet flow? 
Well, uh, we can keep an, our eyes on, the, on some of the expert info within Wireshark. If we open up a packet trace and we see these alerts or alarms in our packet trace, so for example, previous segment lost, if you were in Jasper's session before, we saw a trace file that said that, previous segment lost. So we come up to a segment, the one before it, uh, Wireshark's looking at that and saying, there, there's a missing packet here. Now, in the one he was showing, that packet was later retransmitted. But that is a, a good symptom for us to be concerned about. At that point, we might want to, he did it as well, look at the IO graphs just to see what throughput are we running at. If we're running at a higher throughput, maybe in the 90s to 100 megabits per second, and we're using a, lap, a laptop captured this, we might suspect uh, that perhaps it was the, the NIC that did that, or rather our hardware that we're using. Also, ACK lost packet, even out of orders. Uh, I've seen that uh, in a, an environment or two. So sometimes I'll get uh, clients, they'll send me ca uh, big capture filters, and they say, hey, can you take a look at this? And, and I do keep my eyes out for these, uh, just from the get-go. That way, um, what we're not doing is we're not running down uh, the wrong pathway of, of blaming the network for dropping things, right? Instead, uh, I'll ask them, so where did you capture this? How did you capture it? What was the capture hardware? Uh, can you give me any info on the, uh, was it the span? Was it the cap? What was the utilization like? Uh, in the in the actual capture file, I'll just take a look at bandwidth over time, maybe fire up pilot and see, did I ever hit a certain point where I should be concerned that um, the traffic in this uh, stream or in this capture uh, got to a point where maybe the hardware wasn't able to keep up with it. Now, in Wireshark, there's also at the bottom of the, um, the user interface, I'll bring it up in a second, it's the drop counter. Have you, have you ever seen that before? You have a uh, number of captured packets, then you have displayed packets, and also, oh, where did my Wi-Fi go? I closed it. Give us something to look at here. Now, on the bottom, get my zoom. We see here we have the number of packets then we have displayed, so if we're using a display filter and we apply that, then uh, we can see the number that met that filter. But also down here we have the dropped packet. So it's possible we could see that number increment, but the scary thing is I haven't seen it increment very much dropped, right? So in really high data rates, I can't trust that dropped packets counter. Okay, so what can we do about this? Are we just sunk because we don't have the tens of thousands of dollars to buy hardware-based analysis solutions? Well, no, there's a couple things we can do. Um, it's interesting to see that top one, update list of packets in real time. If we're using the Wireshark GUI to actually go in and, and capture traffic, that checkbox really does make a difference. Let me show you where that is. And what that means is if I have traffic coming into Wireshark, like we've seen, like for example, if I just start a, a capture, I got packets coming in, right? So it's bringing them in and trying to put them out to my screen as quickly as, as possible. And when the traffic level goes up, it's not able to keep up with that process. Now how do I disable that? That's gonna be in our capture options. We're gonna spend some time looking at uh, that little dark circle, that radio button there. We come in here, if we uncheck this, this does marginally impact the amount of traffic that I can capture. Um, it'll bring it up a little bit higher, you know? So th that's one marginal way that we can adjust this, or it's, you know, something we can use to buy a few, few megs or two. But the one that is interesting, this buffer right here, so this is basically a buffer in RAM that is used to store the traffic before it actually gets written to a file or to the hard disk. So in previous versions of Wireshark, so I'm running 1.10, 1, 1 um, in previous versions this was just one meg. So in the, for this version it was up to two. And in fact, as you saw earlier on my wife's laptop, it's running 1.8, right? So that buffer is only at one meg. 
That's why with hers, we shot 100,000 packets at it, and it caught about 37,000. Mine was 60. Just with that one meg difference, we were able to capture twice the traffic. So in, in version 1.10, this is a kernel buffer. Um, I was talking to some of the developers about exactly how that's interacting with the uh, protocol driver, and they were just saying that that's, that's the RAM storage after it comes into the driver before it gets written. So that is one point that we can tune within the, the capture settings. But remember this, if you do go in there and you do tweak that number, you, if you do like I did, add a 20, um, I have found if I go much beyond that, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Uh, if you do tune that and we shut down Wireshark, and we open it back up again, we go into our capture options, remember that it will default back to 2 if we're running 1.10. So what we have to do, we actually have to go into preferences to make this a permanent change. So if you want to, if you want to do that, it's pretty simple to find. Uh, it's just edit preferences. And if we go to capture and come over to interfaces, edit, this is where we can give it a, a harder buffer size, you know, permanent. This is where it will, will lock it to that, that interface. So this is one area that we can adjust it, right? We can set that in our preferences, and we can make sure that we capture more. But unfortunately, I'm still not able to get everything. But the takeaway from this session, and this, this is what I'm hoping for you to see, is a lot of us probably haven't had the opportunity to see this before. So I'm not here to tell you how to get a gig out of your laptop, but I am here to tell you that um, at a certain threshold of, of traffic, you should be concerned about how much your laptop is able to keep up with. All right, and whatever that number is, uh, that, that depends on your system. Um, I know we not, might not have the hardware to, to find out what that is. Yeah, I, it, we can definitely do it here uh, if you want to come up and try. But... Uh, this should be a question, right? This should be something that we're, we're worried about, or at least concerned with. Now, as we were saying earlier, if we come in here to our capture options, if we come in here and put a capture filter on this, again, that dramatically impacts uh, the amount that we're able to keep up with as well. So um, if you are using capture filters on a lower capability machine like a laptop, uh, definitely something you want to just keep aware of and watch for those signatures in your trace file. Look for packets that are missing and take those seriously if it's at a high data rate because um, and it's likely that your machine's just not able to keep up. All right, so there's a few things we can do. Uh, we just talked about optimizing Wireshark. So this doesn't just affect laptops. Your methods are affected too. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion here at, at SharkFest. Also, I'm sure you've read uh, different articles and so on about the difference between a span and a tap and uh, you know, which one's better and when should we be concerned and so on. We gotta remember that if, if I have, it doesn't matter what the box is, is capturing on the other end, I can take my hardware analyzer over here and snap it into a gig link but if I'm spanning traffic to that, and I have one span session, I can't tell you how many times I've been into different environments where they got one span session and they're just taking 20 ports on that switch and firing all of that to the span session. It's gig, 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 out, gig. Right there, I should be thinking, maybe they're over-provisioning this span port, especially if a lot of traffic is being, if it's a pretty good data rate, because in plus out, if I'm spanning both directions on one interface, this gig could or has the potential to over-provision a single span port, right? In a single span port, I've got one channel of gig going out to my analyzer. But if I'm spanning both directions of a one gig interface, it's out plus in together going out that span part, which is potentially two gigabits worth of traffic. So even with one port, we could over-provision a span port. 
So that's another thing to consider because what is that going to look like in our trace file? Same stuff. Potentially, uh, you know, previous packet not displayed. It could be um, the, the different counters that we saw. Again, possibly leading us down that wild goose chase of, oh, the network's dropping packets. We got to go find out where we have FCS errors and different um, packet counters or, or drop counters on the network. It might lead us to the network. So just keep that in mind as well. What method are we using to even get the packets to our analyzer, if our analyzer can keep up with everything? And I say all that just to, to illustrate there's a point. There's a couple years back, I was able to test, do a, a benchmark test with uh, basically a span and a tap simultaneously. So in this picture, what I did is I took two hardware-based um, packet capture and generators. They were actually, I had a box full of OptiViews that I, I borrowed for the day and I was able to, to play with them. So the generator was here. This was establishing a connection with this box over here and we were shooting traffic between the two. On this, on the generator, this one, I went ahead and plugged in a tap and kicked both of those ports out. So it was a breakout tap. So I made sure I had one direction on one channel, the other direction on the other channel with two inputs to the capture. So I knew I wasn't going to potentially overrun or over provision my tap. Had the tap and then also had the span up to a fourth box. So I know I was able to transmit and then capture at my endpoint. This guy was able to capture everything and the other two were able to capture everything too. I wasn't concerned about them dropping packets so much. Um, that's why I used those boxes. So I went ahead and did the, uh, the test. It was actually just a, a throughput test between those two. And here were the results. The results were interesting. Um, the throughput rate was just about uh, 100 megs per second. I went ahead and, and locked the ports to 100 just to give this a try. And it's been a couple years too. But on the tap, the tap captured 133,126 packets. That is exactly what the destination or the other machine captured as well. Those two were identical on the tap. And it was interesting that the, the delta time, the TCP handshake, the delta time there from, um, from the, the sender, receiver, and back, the round trip time, uh, 243 microseconds on the, the TCP setup. Now on the span though, the packets captured was 125,221. Lost 8,000 of them. Now in the counters on the switch, I actually was able to find that number. It knew it wasn't able to forward them all completely over. And this was just under 100 megabits per second. So, and, and the switch was, it was a Cisco, I think 5,500. And keep in mind, it's been a few years back. So uh, I haven't been able to test it recently. But this made me personally just put a question mark on some spans, right? Just to be very clear about what I'm spanning, how I'm spanning it, and what the traffic levels are. Also, the other thing I didn't like was that delta time on the span. Because what does that tell you? 221 microseconds compared to the delta at the sender. What that tells me is the SIN goes through, the, the SIN, TCP SIN goes through the, to the destination. And I did it between SIN, SINAC. I, I got that timer between SIN, SINAC. SIN goes through, goes to destination, destination responds, goes to switch. How on earth could the span be faster than the ultimate destination? In this case, due to that timer, I found that the span was actually getting the packet first then the switch was sending it to the destination because it took longer to get it at the destination. I didn't like that. <laughs> that, that made me mad. <laughs> but, you know, uh, does that happen to every switch? What version, you know, how about this, this, or that? I don't know. In that case, at that time, with that version, under this test, with this test scenario, that was the case. So it really started to make me, where possible, that's why I drag a tap around. That's why I like to tap. Because why? 
I'm really sure that I'm accurately getting what's on that wire, and I don't have yet another device that I then have to question about not only packet count, but also the, the timers, what the, what the, how it's going to influence the real timers at the end of the day. So that, that's why, personally, I'm, a, I'm into tapping. Also, I had another experience where um, uh, I was at a site. It was a, a data center that we were doing some captures at. And these guys, they had just bought their new hotshot little Cisco. It was a 4515 or something. It's been, it's been a, a year or two. Set a span, and they were we were capturing off of their their front end. There was a front end server that they had. They just spanned them on over. The traffic load wasn't too much. Plug my OptiView in. We're capturing, looking at uh, different traffic, looking for you know doing some application analysis on it. About eight hours later the application guys come running in the conference center where we were sitting and they were just like, what did you guys do? You get that Fluke Networks thing off of here? We just start screaming at us. Thinking, whoa, what happened? You know, like, slow down. It turns out that their entire front end application dropped, came back up after a minute. And all connections gone. So of course, you know, I'm the consultant. I'm bringing in this unknown box. They're about, you know, they got a smoking gun that it's, you know, just focused right at me. I'm in their crosshairs. Um, I thankfully had taken the OptiView, and we did not do an in packets enable on their, on their span port. So the OptiView was not able to generate traffic into the network. And I also had set my um, hardware analyzer to not transmit. I just shut it up, like don't transmit it anything, that's not your job, just accept what's given to you, and so we can see what's on the wire. So I knew that it wasn't the analyzer's fault, uh, so they went ahead and said, okay, all right, no problem, we know it's not you, let's go ahead and set this up again. Set the span up again, sure enough, eight hours later, we were watching the switch, whole thing, like that whole blade, boom, powered down, powered back up. So they involved Cisco TAC, they got it. So basically the span, what it did is it tipped a buffer in that card with that rev of code and Cisco went ahead and replaced their whole switch and they didn't see it happen again. But in that instance, <laughs> a span caused the whole switch to tip. I didn't get to work with them on the details after that, unfortunately, but um, wow, it, it really uh, instilled in me the the desire to tap where possible. Now, I understand, like Jasper was saying this earlier in his session, uh, tapping isn't always possible, right? You can't walk up to app server, disconnect it, put a tap in. So with that, I mean, that, that's when we'll just encourage, if, if it's possible, to build it in. Can we plan to make an application or network environment monitorable from the start? instead of building it all out, getting production traffic on it, and then after the fact, coming back and trying to monitor it. So that's what I usually try to, to do with my clients. So what do we do if we find we're getting close to uh, our capture potential on our NIC? If we can find out what that is, 100 megabits, 150, 200, whatever that is, and we need to buy something. Well. I mean, these are the ones that are offered from Riverbed. If we, we can take a look at the TurboCap NIC, um, that has, you know, two or four ports. Now, this thing is designed, is purposed to keep up with line rate gig. That's its whole job, right? So it can, it can do line rate. In fact, uh, the Cascade appliance, not only does it do that, but it also streams to disk. It's got, uh, you know, at, if we're doing high rates of capture, remember, high rates of capture, then, and we need to do long-term um, storage, then, of course, we're going to have to start thinking about shelling out the money. Now, we can do a lot, though, with, uh, with our own capture-to-disk appliance if the traffic level is low. So that's the question. At what point do we start dropping traffic? So those are a couple ones. I mean, there's lots of other vendors that do it. I have one myself up here, a uh, handful of others. So um, I'd like to leave the last few minutes, um, not only for questions, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and power up my uh, um, aggregation switch up here. And if you want to bring up your machine and shoot it, then you're welcome to do that. 
Otherwise, uh, I'll be up here. You can ask some questions, but I do want to leave a little bit of time. I don't have the luxury I did last time of having the whole lunch break. We took up 45 minutes of that last time, so uh, I'll go ahead and cut it now. But uh, thanks for attending, and keep on capturing, but make sure you're getting everything and know, know where your hardware limit is. So thanks for attending.